Mr. Fox and Bear are coming down the road. So we went in the old plantation cave. You see, everybody is chasing everybody, and anybody's chasing anybody because the rabbits are running away, and they're running away from the fox, and the fox is running away from the bear. And um, you go in a little boat, and it's a little stream-like, and you go around and you see all these things. And the bear is real big and funny, and um, you see the little rabbit and um, the drum. As everybody knows in the okie-pinoki, when Mr. Fat Rabbit plays his little jokey, who Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear is the story. For this video, we will not be looking at a haunted case or a haunted location, but something that was once a very creepy looking popular attraction, but is no longer around. Let's take a trip back to June 1967, when Six Flags Over Georgia opened in Atlanta, and one ride burrowed its way into the hearts of families at the time and into the nightmares of future generations. Let's take a look at Tales of the Okie Finoke. Six Flags Over Georgia was originally designed in six themed sections, each of which would pay tribute to one of the nations that had controlled Georgia during the state's history, these being the United States, Spain, France, England, the Confederacy, and Georgia itself. Each area would feature at least one centerpiece attraction to lure visitors in its direction. In the Confederate section of the park, one of the big draws was to be a dark ride based upon the famed stories of Uncle Remus and Br'er Rabbit by George Arthur Joel Chandler Harris. But due to copyright issues, none of the characters' names were used in the ride. But people riding the ride knew very well who the characters were supposed to be. And so the ride was called Tales of the Okefenoki, after the Okefenoki Swamp in Georgia. In a somewhat unusual move, for the first year of operation, Tales of the Okefenoki was presented in a form that was very different from the rest of its run. Six Flags had several art directors on board during its formative stages, including motion picture artist Hans Peters, but the person actually responsible for the ride's first version is still unknown. The original characters in the ride were reportedly small and primitive. Unfortunately, hardly anything remains of the original ride except concept art and a short ride video, so it's difficult to tell what the ride really looked like in the very early 67 version. For reasons unknown, between 1967 and 1968 operating seasons, Six Flags opted to have the entire ride redesigned. For this, they brought in famed puppeteers Sid and Marty Croft, who were already hard at work producing elaborate shows for the park at its sixth location, Six Flags Over Texas. The Croft brothers were already well known for their tremendous puppet work, but their huge success was such children's TV programs as H.R. Puffin Stuff, Lidsville, and Sigmund and the Sea Monsters were still in the future. The Crofts got down to business and completely redesigned the ride scenes, keeping however the huge painted murals that made up the backdrops for the settings. The new animated figures were much larger than the old ones and were designed in a more cartoony fashion. In fact, the cross version of Tales of the Okie Finoki seems to have been patterned quite heavily after Walt Disney's treatment of the Uncle Rima stories as created for the movie Song of the South and its related storybooks. The Crofts recorded a whole new set of voice and music tracks to help their animated figures come to life. The music was obviously composed and recorded on a fairly substantial budget, but the sound effects often sounded humorously homemade. This new version of the ride quickly became a fan favorite with families, and Tim Hollis, a well-known archiver of old amusement park rides and pop culture historian, has the only known recordings of on-ride audio that has been playing throughout this video, and the master reel tapes that the Croft brothers recorded for the second version of the ride. Let me read a little passage from an article he wrote for DaffyClub.com where he described the ride as he remembered it, and I will add the accurate music to go along with corresponding scenes as well as known images of these parts. While standing in line to embark upon the ride, we are treated to a song playing given over the public address system in the queue area. 
The four minute Dixieland ditty gives a preview of what is to come, describing the sights we will see as we float down the river to the old plantation. It features a rousing chorus that sums up the whole experience. So the story goes in the as everybody knows in the when Mr. Fat Rabbit plays his little jokey, we'll fool Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear. Is the story true? We leave it up to you. It's the legend from the old plantation day. Upon taking our seats in the fiberglass boat, designed to look like a Native American craft made of skins, we shove off. Looming ahead is a dark entrance to the ride, flanked by wooden rabbits holding signs cautioning us to keep hands inside the boat and do not feed the bunnies. Floating into this entrance, we are surrounded by a lush growth of artificial vegetation in all colors of the rainbow. Spanish moss hangs overhead, and rounding the first bend, we catch our first glimpse of activity. Owls blink their eyes and hoot in the tree limbs above our heads, while a quartet of crows in hillbilly costumes are in perfect harmony as they sing to us. Welcome, neighbor, welcome. Having received this royal welcome, we float past the swamp's fishing hole, obviously located in the ruins of a former plantation home. Knowing that the crops were utilizing the backdrops and scenery that already existed, it may be that the original version of the ride opened with a pseudo-plantation diorama. Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Fox, and Mr. Bear are all fishing with gigantic hooks and worms, while a bullfrog works on his suntan and a raccoon fumbles with a picnic basket. In one corner, a turtle rocks himself to sleep on the back of his shell, snoring lustily. Now we enter a cave and we are unable to see what lies ahead, except a giant green snake that is peering down at us. We round another bend and suddenly the vista opens up. The critters have formed a gadget band, with old Mr. Rabbit leading the way. A pink female rabbit is clanging potlids together as if they were cymbals, while a chubby boy rabbit wearing a beanie plays a washboard. The raccoon beats an inverted pot and another rabbit somehow manages to make music by blowing on the toilet plunger like a trumpet. Bringing up the rear, the turtle toots on a jug while yet another rabbit pounds a shell like a bass drum. Across the river from all this, a garden of lively animated carrots with the faces of women sing out over and over and over again. Mr. Rabbit is popping up and down inside the bag that Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear have him trapped in, and adding to the drama this moment is a chicken trapped inside Mr. Bear's shack. The panicky poultry keeps sticking its head out the windows to scream distractedly for help. We do not get to see how this crisis is resolved because our boats float on past some of Mr. Bear's crops, but we soon reach another grotto in the swamp. It appears that Mr. Rabbit has been rescued by the friendly owls, who are circling overhead carrying a white bed sheet. From below, that looks like a ghost. The fox and bear are obviously terrified and are cringing at the very sight of the apparition. More trees and colorful foliage interrupt our view, then we approach another clearing. The entire rabbit family is having a field day, and two of the little boy rabbits have rigged up a puppet show with marionettes that are unflattering caricatures of Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear. The rest of the clan is engaged in helping their pa, who has cornered a cow and is milking her for all she has. We are somewhat surprised to see the crow quartet who greeted us at the beginning of our journey. This time, however, instead of words, they are giving us a dire warning. Much as it might benefit us to heed their advice, there isn't much we can do about the constant forward motion of our boat and a huge forbidding cave looms in our path. The speed of the boat slows considerably as we drift into the cave and a chilly wind blows on our faces. It's a horrible sight, especially for a young child, it was very creepy. We have stumbled upon the secret arsenal of Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear. In this cave, glowing under ultraviolet black light, are enough cannons and cannonballs, gunpowder and TNT to blow up the whole swamp. To endanger our lives even more, the Diabolical Duo is blazing away at our boat with their rifles. We escape with our lives, barely it seems, but only to face even greater peril. Emerging from the cave, we find that everything has become pitch dark, save for a reddish glow coming from around the next bend. 
After negotiating the curve, we are confronted by an enormous tree that has fallen across the water, forming a sort of natural archway. On top of the fallen tree, the fox and bear have somehow gotten ahead of us and are swinging red, railroad-style lanterns. The whole scene is horrific, and it doesn't help matters any that the pair is ominously chanting, Beware, beware, go back, go back. Boat is being pulled up by some sort of incline, higher and higher, until it looks like we are going to run into the lantern swinging above us. But at the last second, the boat reaches the summit of the incline and abruptly plunges down the opposite side with a sickening splash. Now things are even worse than before. The entire swamp has been engulfed in a thunderstorm of major proportions, and frightening sights appear everywhere. A huge tree with an evil face suddenly lurches forward as if to fall onto our watercraft. Owls with lighted eyes stare from every tree, and an equal number of huge rattlesnakes hang very close to us from the branches, almost touching our faces. The wind is blowing at gale force as black-lidded black bats circle in the air and on the ground. Fearsome-looking alligators are snapping their vicious jaws. Lightning flashes illuminate the nightmare scene, but how do we get out of this? Suddenly, we spy something ahead. Could it be? Yes, it's the fearsome briar patch. Its huge thorns indeed appear threatening, but everyone knows the briar patch is the home of none other than Mr. Rabbit. And sure enough, we float through an opening in the hillside and find ourselves in the safe refuge of the rabbit's family's underground home. It is Christmas time, and the bunnies are preparing their holiday feast. Mr. Rabbit himself is carving a giant carrot like a roast turkey, and the children are impatiently banging their utensils on the table as Miss Rabbit slaves over the rest of the dinner. We also see next to the fireplace a Christmas tree decorated with carrots instead of ornaments. The young rabbits are enthusiastically singing their own Christmas carol. Outside the Harris Bureau, the storm has passed and the sky is clear and moonlit. And where are Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear? Well, the two chastised meanies have wound up sitting soggily in the mill pond and are covered head to toe with croaking frogs. They both look somewhat bemused by it all. And in the next clearing, we find the grand finale of the trip. It looks like Mr. Rabbit has finally fixed Mr. Fox and Mr. Bear for a good long while. He is using a long pole to shake a large hornet's nest, and the angry swarm is chasing the fear-crazed criminals into the distance. On the other side of the stream is a scene of celebration. The rabbit children and their friends are having a carnival. One of the little bunnies floats in the air, suspended by a giant bunch of colorful helium balloons. A rat and the turtle play on the seesaw. The raccoon balances small rabbits on his shoulders. Jugglers and magicians entertain. Even the crow quartet is on hand. Visible is a plant that is obviously indigenous to only the true deep south, a watermelon tree. And even some of the watermelons have come to life and sprouted eyes and mouths. The air is filled with music as the swamp denizens sing out their national anthem. Overhead, a jolly sun laughs with glee at the sight of the fun below. Our last sight in the swamp is Miss Rabbit, who waves to us from the shore and coos. The boat enters a final cave, the walls of which are studded with multicolored diamonds, and before we know it, we are back in the real world. Everything was going well with the ride, and it even maintained decent attendance numbers through the 70s, but unfortunately, the creative ride did not have such a happy ending in its own future. By the close of the 1980 operating season, Tales of the Okefenokee was in a deteriorating condition, and it was getting worse all the time. Twelve years of repeating the same simple motions over and over had stripped the gears and worn out the machinery that powered most of the animated figures. Even as early as 1975, almost half of the singing carrots had been removed, and the resulting empty spots were filled with extra shrubbery. Maintaining the ride was causing problems for the staff as well. The humidity inside the building was wreaking all sorts of havoc. The huge background murals were suffering, and the characters' clothes and fake fur wore out at an alarming rate. Besides that, it was not only the wear and tear that gave the Six Flags employees headaches, the audio department for the whole park was located in the rear part of the Okefenokee building. In fact, just on the other side of the wall was a Christmas scene. The employees of the audio department were driven half insane by the constant repetition of the Rabbit's Christmas song over and over again, all day long. 
So quite often, they would simply turn off that particular soundtrack, and they would leave the entire Yuletide scene silent. So when you passed by it, there would be no noise, just the sound of the animatronic's gears shifting to the simple movements. Vandalism proved to be another constant problem. The slow-moving boats made an ideal situation for zealous pranksters, who delighted in jumping onto the shore, performing some sort of devilement, and then catching up with their boat downstream. Employees report that the characters' hats were the most pilfered items, but at least once, some enterprising hoodlum managed to cut the marionette strings in the puppet show scene and make off with the fake Mr. Bear figure. Eventually, this problem was partially solved by digging a trench alongside the trough and allowing it to fill up with overflow water, thus giving a sort of barrier between the boat riders and the figures on shore. Outside, troublemakers were one thing, but it was the troublesome singing carrots themselves that nearly caused the whole ride to go up in flames during its last year of operation. The interior mechanism inside one of the vegetables became stuck, making its interior coil become hotter and hotter. The carrots were molded out of polyurethane foam, so when the damaged one caught fire, the entire fire spread quickly. Before the fire had been extinguished, it had destroyed the carrots' backdrop and even spread to the fox and bear who had caught Mr. Rabbit in a bag. These figures had to be massively refurbished. The carrots were a total loss, but there had to be something in their spot to take up the course of Save the Rabbit. The best solution anyone could come up with was to take the four singing watermelons from the end of the ride and put them in the carrots' place. This admittedly looked a bit strange, as the four watermelons did not even begin to take up the space that had been occupied by the dozen or so carrots, but that was the way it went. Because of the fire, as well as the age of the ride itself, Tales of the Okie Finoki was completely scrapped in the off-season. Six Flags hired a team to develop a new dark ride to replace the Tales of the Okie Finoki, and that project is what became Monster Plantation. After Tales of the Okie Finoki closed in 1980, a lot of the animatronics and props from the ride were simply thrown away or destroyed when the building the ride was housed in was bulldozed to make way for the new ride that took the place of this once popular ride. Over the years, a few photos of the ride have surfaced, and there is even some promotional video from the 67 and 68 version of the ride that has survived to give us a look at what this ride may have really looked like. But this ride has really become notable recently for its creepy, almost human-sized animatronics that are literally the stuff of nightmares. <laughs>